Thank you for joining us today for movements of change, dance, liberation, and the power of aesthetics. We wanna start by acknowledging our ancestors whose shoulders we stand on and who we honor through the ritual of movement. We dance atop indigenous lands, soaked in the same blood and sweat as that of our enslaved kin. So we gather in homage of that spirit and the resilience that brought us here today. My name is Aliyah Dun Salahuddin. I am a dancer and graduate student of history here at Stanford University. And it is my honor and privilege to be here with my esteemed guests, Joanna Highgood, founder and artistic director of Zako Dance Theater, a company dedicated to investigating dance as it relates to space place, which fo focusing on making dances that use natural, architectural, and cultural environments, and Colette Elwa, founder and artistic director of Elwa Movement. Colette is an artist cultural worker. She's a doctoral student at UC Riverside of Critical Dance Studies, and is also a community and youth advocate based out of Oakland, California. Throughout our history as African descendants, dance has acted as both a source and an agent of liberation. Through dance, we're able to embody what scholar Yvonne Daniels has termed embodied knowledge. We are here today because you both, as both through your work and through your dance, both artistically and within the community, are expressions of that and you both celebrate and add dimension to our notion of black beauty, using movement as a method and a tool for positive social change in the San Francisco Bay Area. I feel that your work also is both a celebration as well as an affirmation of who we are as a people, what we have, what we have come through and what we can become. So thank you so much for being here today. So I'd like to start by giving a little bit of background about myself and how these, the three of us even got here today. I started dancing at San Francisco State University, studying Dunham technique with Dr. Alberta Rose and master teacher Alicia Ray Pierce. Dance for me was a source of empowerment. It helped me to become a woman. And although I'm now here at Stanford University pursuing a doctorate in history, the most impactful history lessons I learned were not in the classroom. They were in fact in the studio doing Afro-Haitian dance with uh, Miss Pierce. Uh, that was when I met a lifelong friend and ended up auditioning for an Afro-Haitian dance company called El Wa Movement actually in Colette's living room. So Colette, I'd like you to tell us briefly about how the Elwa Movement Dance Company came into being. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. I'm so proud of you, Aaliyah. You are amazing. From the moment I met you, I just was like, this, this one is special. You are both brilliant and you embody. When you came to do the dances, you really embodied the dances. Like, there's some people when they do the dance, it's like they're just recalling something. And I think you are definitely one of those people. But um, for in terms of Elwa movement, um, my last name is Elwa. It means of God. Also means the loi. So when I say Elwa movement as someone who's danced for, a, you know, and did this kind of work for more than a quarter of a century, I mean the movements of the loi, the movements of God. Um, these are the traditions I grew up in. It's also to recognize my um, incredible parents. You know, I'm in their house. That's their picture on the wall back there. And um, their ancestors now, and they were profound, both from Haiti, from very poor places, and just um, imbued in us this type of excellence from being um, descendants of the Haitian Revolution. So Elwa Movement is about me being accountable to that kind of uh, ancestry as well, remembering my father's name and my mother's name. 
Um, Elwa movement means movement of the soul. And it is both born out of the Oakland Bay area where I was uh, surrounded by some of the most incredible African diaspora artists and African artists and had the pleasure to be in um, Lynn Cole's class who taught Haitian dance. And um, she even taught people like Angela Davis took her class in the 60s and also um, Blanche Brown who has um, been holding down the tradition for a long time. And then Elwa Movement is a segment out of Project Reconnect, a collective of artists from the Oakland area that have all gone on to create companies, head um, major art centers like the Lincoln Center. So that this is my foundation. This is my root. And this is why I decided to make Elwa Movement because I wanted to continue those lineages and share the rich culture of um, Haitian folklore and dance and the dances connected to that. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Colette. So much of your work, just through my experience being in the company, was about empowerment, was about revolution. I'll be blunt, you know, it was about that strength that it took for our ancestors to create change. So for you, how is dance connected to social revolution in both the past and the present? How is that, how do you engage the idea of social revolution and change within your work? Well, one of the dances that are maybe uh, one of the quintessential dances in Haitian folkloric dance is the dance called Petwo. Petwo was danced danced by the enslaved Africans at a ceremony called Bwakai Ma that preceded the first successful slave revolt that ended in the beginning of, of the first black republic, which is now called IET. So many don't know this, but um, that ceremony, that situation, the revolution was preceded by the dance called Petwo a dance that's pulsating, it's in your heart, it activates your spine, it's about community, it engages drumming and singing, the singing is done in call and response, and it's not just a physical activation, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional activation. We're calling on our ancestors, we're calling on the higher part of ourself to come to pay attention to something that needs immediate attention. That was what the dance petrol was danced for. And sometimes um, some of the things that I like to point out about the dance is in relation to where we are today. You know, that dance was danced to end tyranny and today we're facing much tyranny. And that back then too, those enslaved Africans, they were not one group. They came from multiple different countries with multiple different religions, multiple different languages. The, what it took, it took many, many months to orchestrate this. There was a woman called Cecile Fatima. Her along with Bukman, they did much coding, much strategic planning across plantations, knowing that eventually they must free themselves. Haiti was known to have some of the most brutal slavery. People did not live past the age of 26. And Colette, I, I just want to be clear for those who are listening in, what Colette is referring to is the Haitian Revolution, mm -hmm. um, which lasted for over 10 years, mm -hmm. or just over a decade, making Haiti the first independent republic in the Western Hemisphere. Yes. For the United States yes. and really was a source of inspiration for those enslaved across the diaspora. So the Haitian Revolution itself is a historical event that I just want people to ground themselves in and know so we can understand and appreciate the knowledge that Colette is dropping here. So um, thank you. Thank you for that so much. In fact, you could say in the new world that um, the Haitian revolution is the mother of all revolutions. Every revolution that followed 
can pay homage to that revolution. And it was preceded with dance. And many of the revolutions um, that followed, Katrina Hazard writes about it in her book, in one of her books, that many of the revolutions that were done by um, people who are called Black, Black people were preceded by organized dancing or ceremonial type praying, prayer type dancing. So I think that's very important to bring to um, to this discussion as you are talking about the aesthetics. It's, it's extremely important. And thank you so much for making that point because this is why we're here, mm -hmm. because I think all of us share the belief that dance, dancing itself is liberation, but dance has been a part um, of our liberation mm -hmm. for centuries. Mm -hmm. And many people across the globe recognize Oakland, California, where your dance company is based out of, although not limited to Oakland, let's get that clear, she's based out of Oakland, but many people do recognize Oakland as a space where social change is cultivated. How does your art connect a larger history of dance? Um, and just more specifically, I feel like you've spoken to that already. It would be great for you to, to connect that to Oakland, California. It's the home of the Black Panthers. Um, it's a center of movement around the movement for black lives. How has your work engaged and connected and bridged those histories? I, I would say almost every work that I, I do is paying homage to that. I've done a piece called The Politics of Poverty. I did a piece with Dimensions Dance Theater, a 40 year old dance institution in the Oakland area. Um, we got together and did a piece called The Town that spoke about the gentrification that um, really changed the face of Oakland. Um, I've done a piece called Alkibulan's Awakening about the role of black women in society, their um, erasure and the appropriation of their ideas and their spirit, as well as the misogyny against them. So much of the work that I do is about that. Um, being someone who married, my husband is, uh, a child of the Panthers. So coming up in that tradition, I learned so much. And, you know, the Black Panthers, they always get associated with violent movements. But the Black Panthers, they are responsible for some of the most um, incredible social um, progressive ideas that took place from community lunches to um, 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 forwarding the idea of health care for all Black people free healthcare, to doing sickle cell anemia testing. They were always in the community and part of many of their celebrations were also um, included dance and drumming. Um, like I mentioned before, Angela Davis took Lynn Coles, my teacher dance class in the 60s. Right. Many, what happened in the 60s, you had, so you were having that Black Panther movement and then you were also having these artists who were coming from Africa like Malunga Cascalord, um, Zach and Naomi Diof, um, C.K. Ledzepo. Um, and so you were having all of this African culture put into Oakland simultaneously with this question of Black liberation. We were facing this idea of we people as no longer a culture, but as a color. And that color being imbued with a false identity and imposed upon us. So when these cultural art forms came in, carrying the archives of our identity, our cosmologies, our worldviews, then th there was a double awakening, I would, I would say. It was both a political and um, a cultural, an artistic awakening that happened at once. And I think that made it very powerful. Yes. Um, and I really, we have a global audience here. We have people from various places in the world. And I really want them to understand um, these dual movements. And maybe we can even say one movement, really, if we're thinking about Black liberation in the Bay Area, dance has been integral to that. You made me even think of how Vevey Clark herself worked with the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. And at the church that she went to was the church where the first breakfast programs were started. So it is Black women already working within these communities teaching dance who supported and lifted up these more better known um, activists who more often than not are men. 
So I think the point that you're bringing up that is crucial important for our audience to get is that dance has always been a part of the movement for the black freedom struggle in the San Francisco Bay Area, that as people were striving for political rights, there was also a cultural revival. There was a huge cultural movement that I myself am a product of, my parents met in the black power movement. And without that cultural movement, I would not be alive. So thank you so much for referring to that because so, and even Stanford University itself is 30 miles away, 20 miles away, 30 minutes rather away from San Francisco and Oakland, but so far removed um, academically from the reality of what is happening. So part of why I wanted to bring us here today is because so many of the students here study these themes of empowerment, of civil rights, of racial inequality, but so few have a knowledge and an understanding of how close they are to the source of all that here. So I think that's so important. Um, you spoke, you actually had the chance in 2017 to travel internationally. You traveled to Ghana and you traveled to Benin. Can you tell me more about that experience and how that may relate to some of the themes we discussed? Mm -hmm. I want to, um, that was a life-changing voyage and um, many things came of it. Um, one of the major ones was the creation of Al Kibalan's Awakening, um, the production that I did in the collaboration with the Ghana National Theater and Ballet Company and Orchestra. And um, that piece was about a woman, Al Kibalan, the word Al Kibalan being a pre colonial term for Africa. And she represents a Black woman who might be found anywhere in the New World. And it's her return. And so each different scene in the first half, we did traditional African dances from different places. Like us African American people, we're, we're not always sure exactly what place in Africa that we're from. So we just did this kind of um, a show of her rites of passage was in South of Africa. South Africa, her birth rights were done um, in West African dance styles so that we can kind of show the beautiful array of different African dances. And also to show this idea that dance for African culture is not first about entertainment. It's first about connection to community, to yourself, to the most high, to your family lineage, to your ancestry, to history, to botanical healing ways. I mean, Dance in our traditions means so much. So that show really showcased that in the first half. Then in the um, in the middle part, they are they're taken away into slavery. Her and um, at her wedding, um, she's they're taken into slavery. And then we kind of talk about that what that looks like. It from her her child being abducted. You know the child being abducted. The family being purposely sent to different places. This was what was typical in um, these kinds of situations during slavery, many times amongst us, we fight, not realizing that we literally could be brothers and sisters because we were separated in that way. The second half of the show highlighted different dances from the African diaspora, like Haiti, Cuba, Jamaica, the US, they were all, um, we all, um, they were all illustrated in that. I choreographed that section, but the highlight was definitely um, the dance that was called Bade. Um, call all the good people. The song is about call all the good people, the ancestors, the children, everything. So some one of the things that was so exciting about, there were so many things and I know I don't have that much time, but I, I was teaching some of the folklore, bon folklore, like old school folklore songs to the Ghana dance ensemble. And some of the people in the company are from Benin and Togo. And so when I start singing one of the songs that's purely Haitian in my mind, she starts singing the song with me and she started crying. And then she, she said, how do you know the song? So that's just a, this testament to the way we are connected to African people. It's, um, Create the creation of that was a connect uh, a, a, an attribute of that, and then there were also expats who were living in Ghana at the time, and um, 
there was this disconnect between Africans and African diaspora people. So we had this um, community dinner where we talked about it because during the slave scene, Africans would laugh where the African-Americans would ball and crying. And then they were like, we don't understand. So that was like one of the first time they were having this conversation about that separation that happened. Because like us in Africa, they received the colonizers education. So there are these kinds of breaks that have not been healed. There's a lot of undoing of imperialism and racism and colonization that to this day, we have yet to deal with. So that piece, Alkibalan's Awakening, was our way of um, dealing with that. And we did programming around it to continue those conversations. Right. That, that's so, what we did, and the last thing I'll say about that, what okay. was one of the most perform, um, profound performances was done at Cape Coast Slave Dungeon. We did it, we invited the um, US Embassy and all different walks of life and the only place at the slave dungeon where millions of slaves went through, the only proper burial was for the slave master. So we danced on top of his, um, danced on top of his grave. Thank you so much for sharing that wonderful, incredibly rich experience. And what I think is so powerful, I mean, there's so many things that you said that are powerful. But what I think is so powerful about what you said is that connection. Um, speaking to your methods through dance, we have the power to transcend all of these centuries of colonization, all the, the systematic effort to separate us. This is how I was brought to dance. This is how I came to be a part of your company. And we actually have the pleasure of having a small clip of Call All the Good People, uh, filmed in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. So this piece you, um, conceptualized here, and then it was performed actually in the motherland, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes. Great. So let's take a moment and let's take in some movement because ultimately all three of us are dancers. So now we are going to watch some movement. This is Colette Elwa, Artistic Director of Elwa Movement, Call All the Good People. What an incredible piece, um, so powerful. So many of the themes that you talked about came through so simply through the movement. Dance is the language of the soul. And I loved how you had the young people there. Joanne, I'd love to hear what are some of your reactions to seeing this dance as a fellow dancer? <laughs> well, I think at one point you said you just wanted to get off of your chair, but just kind of that, that the energy that, provides this uplift you know it, it's just so tangible right it's just it, it's so so beautiful so rich and powerful yes yeah truly truly call yeah. it um so wonderful work wonderful work hmm. um and i was so lucky to be able to have danced with colette when i did um and it's just it's just a joy to see the movement progress and to see you go take uh take it to an international stage so and at san francisco state university um i started off there i started history studying dance but i eventually got very academic with the history 
And oddly enough, uh, through the working towards my master's degree in American history, focusing on the African-American experience and race and ethnic relations, I began to explore my own community that I spent most of my adolescence in, in San Francisco, Bayview Hunters Point. It was the first place that really felt like home to me as a young person, the descendant of migrants who heralded from Kilgore, Texas, never had been formally schooled or went to any type of school because they were sharecroppers, they were mothers, they started businesses, they were truck farmers, they were domestic workers. These are my ancestors. And they came to San Francisco like so many other African-American people with dreams of a better future for my mother, who my grandmother would give birth to in San Francisco. And my mother is very much a miracle because my grandmother's sisters were victims of forced hysterectomies in Texas. So the fact that my mother was born, descended from Artis Lloyd, who gave birth to Della Mae Jones, who traveled to San Francisco in the late 30s and early 40s and gave birth to Yvonne Jones, who had five daughters. And we always say she had the children her sisters could never have. So that journey um, and being in Bayview was the first time that we felt like a family, felt like part of a community. I went to middle school, I went to high school and my research on Bayview Hunters Point um, led me to discover that there was an uprising that happened in Bayview Hunters Point in 1966 when a young 16 year old African-American man was shot in the back by police officers and killed on the hill of Hunters Point overlooking the San Francisco Bay. Three days of unrest was sparked. And I eventually wrote um, an article for the Bayview paper, a local paper based out of San Francisco, which is the voice of the people available online at bayview.com for anybody who wants to read more um, from the voice of the people, which eventually turned into a chapter, which was eventually published into a book which eventually, or into an anthology rather, which eventually brought me to Joanna Highgood and Zockel Dance Theater. So I am really excited to have Joanna here with us today. So Joanna, can you tell us more about how Zako came to be housed in Bayview Hunters Point, this very historic and significant neighborhood? Well, first let me say I'm, always so excited to be in conversation with you and to with whomever you bring into the room because it is it is like uh the storytelling is so deep and uh i feel like i learn so much i fill in all these gaps you know that i've had about uh even my own experiences and certainly this experiences in my community so very excited to be here learning so much already um, but I, you know, I came, I came to the Bay area in 1979 and, um, I had a relationship to different parts of the city, um, and had you know, a couple of studios and had been renting, um, around town, um, more on a, an informal basis. And at one point in the late eighties and 89, I really wanted to focus, uh, my work in one's place because uh, the technical aspects of my work were complicated. And um, so I found a realtor and given my budget, he steered me down towards the Southern end of the city into Baby Hunters Point. And um, the space was very raw. Um, it is, I'll just say it's the same space I've been in since then. Um, so I have really grown into it now. Um, but it was, it was perfect. It had the right height of ceilings. It's very large. It's almost 5,000 square feet. It was as if I could, you know, I could really run and jump and flip and do everything. So it was, it was pretty exciting. And, and not long after that, um, I had been working with youth and in, in, uh, throughout my career at that point. And I decided to just start doing some free classes for 
youth in the community. I think the first workshop was um, for kids from uh, St. Paul's, St. Paul of the Shipwreck. And from there, um, some of the uh, company members knew people who, uh, teachers at Charles Drew, and that relationship got forged and one that, you know, we still feel so honored to, to have. Um, and we expanded, you know, over time of working with, you know, four or five other schools. So there's so before we know it, there's just, you know, thousands of kids that have come through the studio making amazing dances and telling really great stories about, about, about their lives and, and the community. And it's the, I think my relationship to the community is primarily grounded in that relationship to the young people and their families. So. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I feel like I learned something more um, from your story, just hearing how Zako came to be in Bayview, because it's such a staple. It's I've just, it's always been there. Assumed it's yeah. just there. Right. So uh -huh. I know I want uh, people to understand more about your work, which will also have a chance to uh, view some of, uh, it investigates dance as it relates to place, mm -hmm. and it and it focuses on making dance use of architectural spaces. Um, you are trained as a, a aerial uh, a aerialist, um, mm -hmm. so you are not limited by gravity. Uh, <laughs> well, I am limited aren't? by gravity. <laughs> you are limited by gravity, but not However, I work with it. I work <laughs> with it. He works with. Yeah, that's a better way. She works with gravity. <laughs> And I, I have a, a distinct memory of my experience working with Joanna is, you know, oh, you're a dancer? Are you afraid of heights? And at that point, I, you know, I stepped into the world of Zako and I haven't looked back since. So tell us more about how you have sort of reimagined and changed the performance space and how you engage African-American history because so mm. much of your work um, from picture Red Hook to picture Powderhorn to picture Bayview Hunters Point, which we're gonna talk more about. Mm. To um, uh, the uh, what is uh, remind me the name of the show um, about the Black Exodus from San Francisco? Oh, sailing away, sailing away with Amar mm. Tabar Smith was a major dancer, also yeah. an incredible spirit. Who, if we had more time, extraordinary in this room. So. We want to give thanks yeah. to Amar Tabar Smith for all the amazing work that she's done. Um, yeah. So tell me more about your work, your process, your engagement with these space and history. Well, I'm, I'm really interested in this idea of place and how we assign meaning to it, um, what the tangible markers are that record or express the experiences that define it. Um, I'm, I'm, I think my, my, I, like most artists, my work is really research-based. Um, I'm particularly interested in histories, as you know, um, social histories, um, cultural histories, environmental histories, oral histories. Um, I do a lot of field measurements. Um, I study light. I'm very interested in the rhythm of a place, uh, the dynamic uh, energies there, um, material. I often think about place or site as material, what it means to move through concrete as opposed to moving, you know, through water or on the ocean, um, sound, weather, which is, of course, the most challenging when you're making work outside. Um, I'm also interested in time and how we perceive time in different cir with different circumstances, how we anticipate, how, how it feels expanded, how we get lost in it how it's metered and so on. Um, I also, I build the choreography more dimensionally and that's how the aerial component comes in. Um, I, uh, and you know, this kind of working on the vertical plane uh, and creating, w working with kind of the volume of this space. I often think about the work as, as time-based sculpture and I use the bodies to, you know, draw these lines in various directions and, and that the movement and the storytelling is what charges uh, the space with this next layer of meaning. Um, and what else? Um, they're immersive. People, I, I, some of them 
perhaps feel a little demanding <laughs> for audiences. <laughs> and now you have to walk for two hours or you have to watch a show, you know, repeat for six hours. Um, but um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I am, I, I really want to be in a direct conversation with the audience. And so in order to do that, taking them outside into a place where there isn't a prescribed relationship like in this theater you know i'm here you're there lights go on and and there's a i think you know certainly uh successful artists of which there are many um can put, draw people into a story and suspend them in a moment that removes them from the kind of the uh you know the confines or the the context of what a theater is right but um for me, I'm not very good at that, <laughs> one, um, but it's not that interesting to me as a pursuit. Being outside and being in a place that actually speaks and resonates directly to uh, a history or directly um, as a metaphor um, is, is more powerful. Um, and that's just a per personal preference not to, you know, try to... Um, right belittle some, someone else's process because as I said that's not the thing that um that pushes me as an artist but others I I am you know it's inspired by as well you know who yeah. work in theaters but um but anyway I I think about I think thinking about this question uh to give an example of um you know sometimes I think of the place uh, like the inspiration for a work, you know, comes different, comes, um, arrives in a different way, depending on where I am. And sometimes the place itself, the history of that place, uh, inspires me to tell that story. And, um, for example, uh, Jacob's Pillow, which is, a uh, the oldest dance festival in the United States. It's in, um, Beckett, Massachusetts. It was a station on the Underground Railroad in the mid 19th century. And that story, and particularly at the time when, when I was really discovering it too, which is in the 90s, um, uh, it was the perfect place to interpret um, that story. And speaking of Amara, Amara was in that work. And that, for me, you know, these these experiences like this land gets gets uh these these this energy and these experiences get kind of laid into the foundation of what is there in the trees in the in the earth in the buildings and and they ring out and oftentimes we don't hear them because we have cut ourselves off to that sensitivity of being present you know, being present in, in these places. And, but when you let them, the, the reveal is just, um, it can be life-changing. And so being in that space, telling the story of our enslaved ancestors, um, really resisting that state um, by using their bodies and moving their bodies, using their feet uh, to, to move um, is, was just so powerful. And thinking about those dances, you know, um, and just connecting to, to the dance Colette that you showed, um, you know, thinking about the ring shout and these, these, these dances that were really about transporting us, you know, becoming these vehicles to transcend those conditions into the place where we could gather that, that courage and that um, strength to endure and to take action. Right. So anyway, um, so that's one example. And then the other was, uh, uh, um, is the airport in San Francisco. Uh, there was a local festival that, um, commissioned a work. Uh, the festival that year was focused on the African diaspora. And I went to the airport and I'm like, whoa, okay, what is it? Airports are all about traveling, you know, moving from one place to the other. And oddly enough, in the airport, the architecture 
includes some very distinctive features. And, and one of them is this, these trusses that I think they're called footballs trusses, but they look like boat hulls. You know, they're, they're exactly the shape of the boat hull. And it, I felt like that was the perfect launching place um, to tell that story about our arrival, our first arrival here in this country and, and you know, all of the, what has impacted us over time. And so um, that was an installation work and people were moving, coming from, you know, one airline moving to another. It was right in the international terminal where, um, where the ticketing area was. And so, you know, they shut down the ticketing area for me to build the piece there. And, uh, but it, it, it was anchored in this powerful metaphor of movement and traveling, you know, and you felt that, right. You, you, you were feeling that just by the energy of people with their suitcases moving back and forth. But, but our arrival, our story is so unique. Um, it's so, um, and so devastating, of course, and yet that sense of resilience, those dances, you know, that sense of, um, and that sense of pride and courage and dignity uh, is, has really transformed our situation into something new and it has held us in a place for our own survival. Um, so, so that's kind of the basic idea of what, what I, you know, that's what I've been working on for the last four years. <laughs> I'm still learning. I'm still learning. I'm still well, learning. We all are. And, and yeah. your work is so incredible. And as you were describing the history lashing out at us, I had written yeah. this two dimensional uh, essay utilizing archive, utilizing oral history. And mm. it was pressed into pages with ink and when I started working with you it's almost as if we we just essentially took that story and we added dimension mm. the picture Bayview Hunters Point show which I know was uh, um, also uh, preceded by picture Red Hook and picture mm -hmm. Powderhorn Powerhorn uh, Powderhorn, excuse me, is that correct? Yes, Powderhorn in Minneapolis. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you, Indianapolis. Um, which and and that is where you spoke earlier about. That's where uh, George Floyd um, was from, and that incident, and how your work was still within that space. And mm -hmm. there's this residue from our experience that is left over in the material world that I feel like you uncover. That mm -hmm. essay. Part of that um, uprising was centered at the opera house where the show was. Literally mm -hmm. bullet holes were in the building and covered over. Um, National Guards had shot into the very building that we were dancing on top of, inside of, and on the and, <laughs> and all around. Yeah. It. And so um, how did Picture Bayview Hunters Point come into being? And what what was that experience like for you? For me, it felt like we described it as a love letter to Bayview Hunters Point, just yeah. as much as a awakening as a celebration. So I'd love for you to speak about Picture Bayview Hunters Point, um, your experience, how it came into being. Well, um, when I first got to San Francisco, there were, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, when I moved to Bayview, but maybe about, I guess maybe in the mid 90s I, or early 90s, I started just collecting interviews or and collecting is not quite the right word. I became interested in who was, you know, who was there or where, where and where I was. So um, I, my studio, I'll just back up because this is kind of an interesting thing. My, my studio is um, in at the site of a, a, a former mattress factory. And uh, it was the original Serta factory in San Francisco. That building was built in the 1920s. So it was like one of the early industrial area um, sites kind of amidst all of the farms that were in that area at the time. And the room uh, or the studio that I am in was where um, they made pillows. 
And so I often think about that space as this dream space, you know, and I was thinking, I guess this idea of what people dream about and particularly dream about in relationship to community has long been something that I've been gravitated, gravitated to. So um, I started going out and asking people if they want to do an interview and just hear their stories about, well, well, what was here? And I met people who were born in Bayview and, you know, in the teens and, um, you know, it was all just an incredible array of people. And so um, about 20 years ago, it became clear that gentrification was in the process of, of basically taking over uh, the, the community. And, um, you know, the planning meetings started and concerns were raised and, and you know, questions came up around uh, the equity of redevelopment. And that particularly was something that I was really questioning too, that whole process. If we look historically um, around the country, and really in, in, in many urban environments around the globe, you see that working class and, and low income communities are really not considered as part of the larger vision or the future in a redevelopment project. It's like, that's the kind of the stepping stone. People get displaced and, you know, all this money finally gets poured in and amenities and the services that have been missing, um, you know, come to the place and, those who really deserve and who you know stuck it out and have fought for it are are moved, and that's um, you know these projects require a tremendous amount of investment, as you know, and the investment really demands a return, and that requires people with with deeper pockets. Um, so, um, so anyway, even though I feel like San Francisco, I you know believe that they were you know creating a process that was going to be ac- equitable. We can already see just through looking at price tags that that's not really going to happen. So anyway, one of the ways that uh, redevelopment agencies and these projects kind of justify their actions is by you know kind of exposing or proving, really proving blight and social decay. And in the case of Bayview Hunters Point, I mean, which has had, as you know, has had plenty of social struggle, struggle but that is built directly on the uh, legacy of racism and white supremacy, um, which, you know, you have um, researched extensively. And uh, so, but the outfall of this struggle, you know, is what the media latches on to in order to perpetuate these negative stereotypes that that's needed to uproot and displace the communities, right? And this is, it's kind of almost formulaic, right? You know, you get all these parts lined up uh, to kind of create this picture that then justifies um, this, this, this level of, um, I didn't even know how to explain it, this kind of, tragic and inhumane behavior on you know and and you said picture and when i think about the name of the show picture bayview hunters point it's mm. almost as if you were inviting people to reimagine let me yes do a real picture of exactly the point and so being in bayview i mean i knew that there was an extraordinary history of of activism you know of industry of culture you know, which was not the picture that, you know, over all these years, you know, and it's just, just, just to say that, you know, that this, those, uh, that perpetuation of those stereotypes is not just in redevelopment. I mean, it's also in support of white supremacy, you know, and all the other stuff that we can spend many hours talking about, but I knew that it was different, right? We know that there were amazing things happening in that, in our community. So, um, so, and so much of that was evident evidenced already in the interviews that I had. Right. So I thought, okay, so how, how can I support um, this movement? And I guess in the, in the context of what you are examining at this, this movement of resistance um, and anchoring, um, how do I support that with, an artwork that gives voice to 
a community's own vision, um, their dream for their future. And, you know, when you hear them, it's like, you know, everybody wants to have similar things. They want their kids to, you know, have a good education. They, they, they want to have good food. People talk about, I want some vegetables that, you know, I, that, that I can go down to my market. I want to have a movie theater. I want to feel, I want that fresh air. I want this, you know, I want things that everybody else wants. You know, I think uh, Carol Tatum at one point says it, it's, she just wants people to know that, you know, we're just like you, we bleed, you know, we have our joys. Um, and so anyway, these personal visions are, were so, so beautiful. And to put them in the center of the town, you know, and, and to not to avoid all of the, the part of this struggle, you know, because right. I think that that needs to be acknowledged, but to also, you know, uplift this vision um, that we have for, for our future, which is positive, which is beautiful, which is, you know, energized by, um, by um, a culture and a spirit that is, um, it just is a um, world-class. It's world-class. World class. Yeah. So, yeah. so now we're going to enjoy some of this wonderful work. Um, if you've seen the show already, you get to relive it. If you haven't, welcome to Bayview Hunters Point. We're going to watch clips from scene one and from scene three. Um, the last clip is a manifestation uh, and a representation of some of that history I was speaking to earlier. So please enjoy Picture Bayview Hunters Point. Matthew was 
deeply felt by the whole community. That was the beginning of what would be San Francisco's three-day uprising. One storefront window turned into several, but even then, young people anger did not want to be frustration, so they were trying to calm people down. They were trying to live in the nation streets. Um, and by the next day, the mayor and the governor declared a state of emergency, 2,000 National Guards, California Highway Patrol, San Francisco Police. They all rush into this eight square block to make the public's point. And that is the beginning of this very violent 120 hours. Their neighborhood become a military zone. They crush and tanks. They oh, crush and, and young people, by the second day, are so afraid, the national so guards, afraid. they align themselves on the part of the and people because there's word of a sniper in the Baby Hunters White Community Center. No sniper was ever found. So that was enough for the National Guard to shoot into the crowd of people outside of the Bay Hunters Point Community Center. Several people are wounded. Adam Rogers, many people are hurt. One of the activists trying to get people off the street is shot in the back. Adam Rogers, he got a black red truck and he drove up and down Third Street telling people to stop tearing up the street. of years of the community, decades of the community, struggling to address these issues of unemployment, of police brutality, of, of inadequate housing conditions, of racial discrimination, and everything centers around the death of Matthew Pino Johnson. Watching those clips brings me back every time. And yes, audience, that was me on the roof in the performance. Scholars can be dancers and artists as well. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> and I think, and I know my work was enriched through exploring it, through movement and through dance. And to see those images, which is archival footage projected onto the wall, to have my voice and to be bear witness to people's response is something that the historian does not get. Oftentimes I write something and I send it off. So it was such an incredible experience, but that is what I think in both of the works that we've seen is so powerful about dance. In Colette, in the dance that we mm. saw, there was a feeling of freedom and liberation that was palpable that we felt almost instantaneously. And we saw this history come to life at this site we got an opportunity to really expand what research can look like and what it can be. So thank you both for sharing your work. And mm -hmm. I want us now to really think more broadly, we're in this present moment. This presentation is called Movements of Change, Dance is Liberation and the Power mm -hmm. of Aesthetics. The broader presentation is Methods of Protest. And both of your work, I feel like really uplifts and celebrates and honors the trajectory that is this beautiful struggle that is blackness, right? So how do we see us going forward? How is dance, what is the role of dance as we all move through this very, these times that will never go back to the same? Mm -hmm. How integral, how do you see dance playing a role in that change that we all know that we need? Mm -hmm. I think and um, that dance is essential right now. We are on computers all the time. We're not in our bodies at all. We're not in proximity to each other. Dancing is about community. It's about being together. It's about being inside of your body. It's about place, like we just learned from Joanna's um, presentation. So I think it's essential. I think not just for Black people, for all people, dance reconnects you to your culture so that you could get separated from this concept of a color, being a color, not just black lives, but all colors. And, and let's find out what we Thank really you. are. What is our real ethnicity? Exactly. And I think one important distinction to make here that you know scholar Vincent Brown often makes is that the history of race is not the history of African-Americans. Mm. The social construct yeah. that is separate than our history and our story is very much related to. Okay. So what you're talking about, Colette, 
is us actually getting in tune with who we are. And through that process of self-discovery, that is how we tap into our greatness. Yeah. That is how we can create change. Joanna, and, and, I would love and, to- I, I say ditto to that. And also just to write, and part of that is it's it's an embodied experience. And right now, as, as Colette was alluding to, we've been really separated from that. We've been, we are creating environments and situations that are disembodied. Um, so, you know, coming back to those traditions that support our storytelling to, to support just our physical bodies of moving and moving energy um, is, seems so, so important. And I think coming together, creating an empathic environment for us to be together in that we understand that connectedness to recognize the magic and the joy of what life brings. Um, all of that I think is, is inherent in, in these deeper practices of, of dance. Um, so. Yeah. I, would like to, I would like to comment on, on, uh, I used to say empathic, that kind of, mm -hmm. There is that kind of, I didn't realize it until, you know, years of teaching dance and being in a room with people, mm. how much that gets communicated through just proximity, through yeah. being around each other and movement and seeing expression and everything like that. And then I think that there is also this energetic vibrational information that gets passed. And I think that now that we are consumed, especially young people are always looking at phones that some of, some of that humanity, some of that is essential to our humanity is getting lost. And I mm. think dance really does an excellent job in preserving that kind of human interaction. Yeah. Yes. And there's, some, then there's something so powerful about when you align in a rhythm together, when you are in a group and you, you fall in, yes. in time and, and that wave, uh, that, is, that is so beautiful and so powerful. And, you know, for me, dance saved my life. Dance is a spiritual practice for me. Dance, I think for everyone is a salvation. And what is in these really challenging times, what I also think is incredible is that the ways in which even, even liberatory dances have been colonized and put into studios and put into spaces that we have to pay rent for. Now, <laughs> as a dancer, I'm being challenged to, can you just step outside and dance barefoot in the grass? Yes. Can you get together with your sister and play some drums? And so there yeah. is actually, there's this really something so invigorating and so liberatory about dancing safely. I wanna emphasize safely to everybody here watching outdoors yeah. in nature and how rejuvenating that is. So mm -hmm. as sad as we can be that we are not allowed to go to these spaces and connect in these wonderful ways, and don't get me wrong, I love technique and dance studios. It's also an opportunity for us to reconnect with our bodies, as you both um, have mentioned, and to reconnect that the element of dance to nature, which is where yeah. it's started, yeah. right? So yeah. 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 I think our ancestors were brilliant in that. Sometimes when people go to understand African rooted dances and how they are bare, done barefooted on the earth, mm -hmm. people immediately equate that with like poverty or peasants not having shoes. When there is um, a method to that, a healing method of dancing barefoot in grass on in dirt, there's like a yeah. healing that happens and a connection to the earth and then talking about space again, your beautiful work. I just love that piece. It's very moving. Oh, um, like um, that, co that connection to space, it's like on another level inside of African diaspora dancing. Because mm -hmm. you, you call the earth your relative. You mm -hmm. know, you call the trees around you to something that each, there are different trees that are sacred. They have such a meaning. Mm -hmm. They're part of the family the interactions, the activity of family. So I find it very interesting. Uh, Lee and I was having that discussion when we did the Back to the Root um, conference with Latanya Tigner is um, how it's this time is calling us to return back to the authentic mm -hmm. ways of doing things and re, like you all was re, were reimagining what that space is about. 
This is helping us to reimagine ourselves on the planet, in the earth, you know, mm -hmm. and then keeping things um, healed, you know. And, yeah. and basically, basically, I think the pandemic is uh, that kind of um, ideological whiteness, that mm -hmm. ideological imperialist take, you know, into um, use into the point of sickness, right, mm -hmm. over over everything, <laughs> like too much, buy too much, need too much money to the place where sickness comes, you know? Yeah. 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 So I think that this is the, an important way to sort of wrap up our conversation is to reiterate the point that as troubled as these times are, this is an incredible opportunity to change, to move, is to literally change your vantage point, is to literally change. Mm -hmm. So the more that we move, the more that we engage with what is natural to us, the more that we become embodied, which is essentially yeah. dancing. If you're walking down the street, you're dancing, you just don't know it. Mm -hmm. The more liberated we become. And that is something that people of the diaspora and African-Americans in this country who are suffering rest in power, all those victims who have suffered and died unjustly at the hands of law enforcement, at the hands of violence. But I think that the message I want everybody listening to take away from this is that dance is liberation. The act of it itself is liberatory. The creation of it is liberatory. It grounds us in who we are and where we're going. So I just want to thank you so much for Sharon, we can go on and on, but thank you so much, Joanna Highgood of Zako Dance Theater. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Colette Elwa of Elwa Movement. Please do follow up and support these locally based, female run, African, yeah. African American owned businesses <laughs> because they operate off of the generosity of so many people. So if you feel inclined to learn more or support, there'll be more information. Thank you so much. And I hope that you find a way to move in your day to day. Have a wonderful Thank day. Thank you so much.